Good afternoon. Welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Len Calabres, past president of the Board of Trustees. Many political commentators have observed that environmental concerns will play an important role in this year's presidential elections. Some of those concerns have already surfaced. Climate change, how serious, how best to respond, the debate over energy issues, should there be more offshore oil drilling? What about clean coal technology? How much commitment should there be to alternative fuels and what should be the government's role? Water issues are receiving more attention as are environmental health issues such as lead poisoning. And of course, there's the fundamental question about the relationship between environmental protection and economic development and job creation. Our speaker today, Carl Pope is an experienced, savvy participant in the political process. He has been with the Sierra Club nearly 30 years and has been executive director since 1992. During his tenure, 150,000 new members have been added, increasing their membership to over 700,000. The Aspen Institute, after surveying every member of Congress and key federal officials, named the Sierra Club the most influential environmental organization in Washington, D.C. Carl Pope is also a founding member and officer of America Coming Together, a coalition of many of the largest membership-based groups in the country working together to increase voter turnout and participation. Mr. Pope graduated summa cum laude from Harvard College in 1967 and then spent two years in the Peace Corps in Bihar, India. He is an author, serves on several boards. Please join me in welcoming back to our Cleveland City Club podium, Carl Pope. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. I want to begin by thanking Stanley and Hope Adelstein, who have hosted me once again, uh, and for all of their generous contribution to this community and to this club. Let's have a round of applause for them. And I also understand that it's a 90th birthday for Stanley. And if you're not nice to me, I'll sing happy birthday, so <laughs> be warned. It's wonderful to be back here. Uh, Fourteen years ago, uh, I first appeared at the Cleveland City Club. And my remarks that day bore a title quite similar to today's speech. Fourteen years ago, I addressed you on the topic, looking for gold in all the wrong places. My title today is somewhat more hopeful sounding, looking for gold in all the right places. Uh, and I want to go back and revisit some of the comments I made 14 years ago and look at where we've been for that decade and a half. I said a new economy is struggling to be born. It can produce goods and services at a fraction of the cost of our present economy. It should be the green economy of the future. But I warned that this new green economy, which would use human intellect and imagination in place of depleting nature as its source of value, was in danger even as it is being born or being strangled by accumulated patterns from the old economy, the gray economy of the past. The biggest danger, I said 14 years ago, would be our reluctance to admit that much of the wealth we thought we possessed was based on bogus bookkeeping. That it was not really value. It was simply layers and layers of hidden subsidies and bad accounting. And we were not as wealthy in 1994 as the numbers told us we were. But I warned that those subsidies would be vigorously defended by those who received them, even though they made no economic sense, that the old economy would hold on, that its beneficiaries 
would fight back and that it would be very, very difficult to make clear to the American people the simple truth that when you cut down a forest and don't replant it, you have not created value. You have depreciated your landscape. That when you overfish a lake or an ocean, you are not increasing your wealth. You are depleting it. That when you poison a river, you're not producing cheap goods, you're losing incredibly valuable fresh water. But I said eventually, the truth will always come out. Imaginary wealth is always found out because when you reach out to touch it, you realize it isn't really there. But I warned that if we continued to cocoon ourselves in the myth that our economy told us the truth about how wealthy we were, we might come to our senses too late. I'm going to suggest that I think we are now all recognizing that I was right. We are beginning to recognize that when we cut off the top of a mountain, we are not producing cheap coal. We are taking away communities and homes and schools from people who live downhill without any compensation. When we continue to allow power plants throughout the Midwest, power plants which have no pollution controls, power plants which by federal law were supposed to be cleaned up 20 years ago, when we allow them to continue to operate without pollution controls, we are not generating cheap electricity. We are creating expensive health care. And the old economy is not satisfied only with these kinds of hidden subsidies. In 2005, the poverty-stricken and penurious oil industry managed to persuade Congress to give it an extra $17 billion in direct subsidies each year. That same Congress in 2005 decided that 85% of the cost of any new nuclear power plants built in the United States would be borne by the taxpayers, not by the people who were building the plant. We continue, after rounds and rounds of congressional mandate and dozens of acts of courts, to give away the timber of the Tongass National Forest at a fraction of the cost, not of its value, but the cost of actually getting it to timber sale. We are no longer investing in the health of our national forests. We are instead diverting the money which is appropriate each year to help prevent forest fires to subsidize the timber sale program. Uh, last week, and I want to give the president full credit, he did the best he could to prevent this, but the Congress of the United States passed a farm bill in the middle of a world food crisis which was written without a single nanosecond of thought about whether that farm bill would help or worsen the world food crisis. And we appropriated billions of dollars for a handful of agribusiness operators in ways that will not feed the world, but will bankrupt both the Treasury and the American landscape. And, of course, for 14 years, they have been telling us that we didn't need to worry about global warming. That when we put trillions and trillions of pounds of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse pollutants into the atmosphere, there would be no bill, or at least somebody else would pay it.